There's always been an innovation economy, and J.P. Morgan has an entire business dedicated to helping it thrive. By bringing together founders, startups, investors, and ideas, J.P. Morgan's Commercial Bank helps empower thousands of high-growth companies, companies that are shaping the present and the future. With tailored banking solutions and a global business network, J.P. Morgan helps innovators scale for today and tomorrow. Visit jpmorgan.com forward slash startups to find out how they can help you build your future. Products and services of J.P. Morgan Chase and & Company and its affiliates are subject to availability, eligibility, and applicable terms and policies. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hey, everyone. I'm Matt Burns. Welcome to Tech Brunch Live, where we help founders build better venture-backed businesses. And uh, I'm feeling it today. This is big, partly because of the guests, yes, but also we're finally streaming live on the top of TechCrunch.com. No login, no registration required. If you want to watch the event and see the pitch deck, not just listen through Twitter spaces, head over to the top of TechCrunch.com and the live stream is, is right there. You can't miss it. And then second, we have amazing guests. We have Trevor Martin. He's the co-founder and CEO of Mammal, Mammoth Bioscience and leads one of the most impressive, promising CRISPR startups out there. It was founded in 2017, is worth more than a billion, and uses CRISPR to rapidly and simultaneously detect multiple medical conditions, like 20 minutes fast. It's crazy cool. And Jennifer Dudna, you know, the, the Nobel Prize winning scientist who helped develop CRISPR, she's a co-founder of Mammoth. So the, these, these guys are legit. And joining Trevor today is Mayfield investor Yershi Parikh, a leading venture capitalist who's extremely selective on his investments. But when he invests, he's all in. Yershi is very bullish on Mammoth and sits on the company board and invested in most of Mammoth's fundraising rounds. It's an honor to have them on TechCrunch Live today. As I understand it, it wasn't Trevor's pitch per se that won your sheet and Mayfield over, but rather Trevor's busy business savviness. This company wasn't born from Trevor's Stanford PhD thesis, but rather just the promise of CRISPR. Trevor saw this massive opportunity in 2017 and took an Aaron Judge size swing at it. So today we're going to talk about what investors look for in early companies and outside the general talking topics. How should the business be structured and what pieces need to be in place to get the best chance at fundraising? But uh, first, we're going to start with Trevor. Trevor, how are you? Good. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's talk about that first meeting you had with your sheet. What was your expectations going into it and where was Mammoth Bioscience at the time? Um, yeah, I don't know. I came into the industry pretty fresh, so I don't know if I had many expectations, more just curiosity. Um, but yeah, wait, I think, wait, wait, what, why do you say that? Yeah. Cause I, I think, uh, Mammoth and the founding team, myself, uh, of course, Jennifer Doudna and Janice Chen and Lucas Harrington, who are star graduate students in Jennifer's lab, were part of this new wave of, uh, kind of scientists, founders of companies where, you know, we've done PhDs in biology and, then you know we're really excited about the potential of this CRISPR technology across therapeutics and diagnostics, but didn't know anything about <laughs> venture fundraising or uh, what a term sheet was or anything like that. So I think what drove us, especially in the early days, and you know what uh, led us to our sheet and what made us resonate together, I think is just excitement around the potential and not really necessarily understanding anything about the mechanics of fundraising or venture. I think sometimes people see that as a barrier of like, oh, I need to like read up on like safes and like how I structure things. I mean, of course you want to get savvy on that, but I think if you come in with enthusiasm around an idea that you want to dedicate your life to, like that's the number one thing and everything else is secondary to that. To I think I just highlight my ignorance uh, there as a, a, you know, encouragement to others that are maybe equally ignorant at the start. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I got to push back a little bit because I read a lot about what your she wrote about you personally, and he was very impressed with you. Why, before I ask him, I want to hear from you. What, what do you think he was impressed with? Yeah, uh, I mean, don't want to toot any horns here. Uh, no, 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 but this is what think... I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to ask you these questions. <laughs> yeah, I heard him questions. yeah. Um, I mean, I think uh, one thing I do find to be a huge asset in entrepreneurship is open-mindedness and just an ability to take feedback. And you shouldn't always agree. Like, the, yeah, like that's not an interesting conversation either, but to really understand that there are things that you don't know, and there's things that you know, and that, um, you know, the only way you're going to build a lasting company is to actually take the best parts of everyone that you interact with and then kind of view them through your own prism uh, and combine that together. Uh, I think that open-mindedness is what I find 
uh, I take the most pride in personally. Yeah, your sheet. I want to hear your your viewpoint on this. Where was Mammoth when you first talked to them, and and what what made you invest? Uh, so I think uh, you know we first invested in Mammoth in the seed round. I think the company was called Failure Diagnostics then, and and then uh, we led the Series A round uh, out on that end. Um, in the seed round, uh, uh, what stood out was that um, uh, you know there was a big trend and wave. Right, Trevor had identified that. He had made a leap. It was not his PhD thesis area. He had actually gotten a license from UC Berkeley. Uh, generally good recommendations and references. And they had a starting operating business plan, which was probably the most plausible business plan what somebody could create in diagnostics with mm. the IP that they had licensed. Uh, it was actually very thoughtful. It had gone through several iterations, right? And, and when asked, you know, Trevor was upfront about it. Um, along the way, while it was a very specific product, what stood out was that there was a mission, there was a purpose, there was a vision. Um, you know, um, uh, there was almost this whole, there, there was actually a little logo, uh, you know, which was Mammoth Inside, kind of like, you know, taken uh, from Intel Inside. Uh, and, 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 and just sort of looking at the general composure, the ability to have a conversation, right? Sometimes what happens is when you ask somebody a question, um, you know, in a pitch meeting, there is a tendency to want to sort of take 80% of what you do and reconfirm that to the person asking the question. Uh, there's value in acknowledging the other 20%. Whether you agree or not is not there, but just so because then it kind of gives you a sense on how that conversation happens. Can, um, can you give an example of that? Um, so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like, do you do X, Y, and Z? Or like, how are you going to go ahead and, or, or do you want to sort of like, do you, you, know, you want to do this as a diagnostic or as a platform, but what will become, do you have everything that you need to sort of do the platform? And there's this point about we have X, Y, and Z, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but on the everything, you know, we don't have these few things, or this is where we may need help kind, kind of, kind of thing. Right. Um, and so, so what it does is it, you know, if you really think about fundraising, it's very much, it's let, it's, it's a little bit like. Uh, a confidence building process, right? And when people feel that they can engage, all sales processes are like more building confidence where people then have to kind of get comfortable in the dynamic of they are sort of, you know, going to part with whatever money they're responsible for, for sure. a sort of mission and purpose where there will be an alignment in the way things will work. Um, but that was that was just out at, at the seat, right? And then what we saw was uh, sort of just an amazing kind of working dynamic develop. Uh, and and on many many counts and I'll uh, and you know I'll I'll let you kind of go in with more specific questions but um, you know one thing I'll kind of bring out right which is that as Trevor then wanted to really realize the mission of Mammoth and he was true to the mission that uh, when a time came between Seed and Series A to really sort of join forces and bring Jennifer and Janice and Lucas all together under one tent under one company uh, you know and 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 sort of take seventy percent dilution at a personal level. Uh, to kind of go ahead and do that, right? Uh, um, yeah, that's he, a lot. He, he, and he got to that decision very quickly, uh, literally even less than 24 hours. And it was because of his true mission orientation and alignment to the mission. And, and uh, uh, you know, there's a lot that happened between the seed and A. It was a six month process. But, uh, but, but I've been bringing this one up as like, you know, if you, you know, if you think of a company as a movement, right? And a platform, then you can get a lot of other great people to align with you, join. You have sure. to sort of and inspire and lead, but you also have to give people platforms. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so having that true North, a strong culture mission, right? Those, those things go a long, long way. Yeah. Um, well, I was hoping we could take a step back and Trevor, what does mammoth inside really mean? Where did that come from? Yeah. So the idea is that uh, Mammoth were pioneering this kind of next generation of CRISPR technologies and systems across therapeutics, diagnostics, and beyond in other areas like agriculture and biomanufacturing. And uh, what's really exciting is that this CRISPR technology can be used across a variety of applications, um, both stuff that we build internally um, and you know bring to market ourselves. But then also excitingly, you know, the way this technology is going to reach its full potential is by working with others as well to you know. Get to the market in places where you know they have really great expertise or like you know they've gone before or they have complementary technologies and i think that's one of the really exciting things when you have what we call like a platform technology where it's not just a single product it's actually 
potentially dozens or hundreds of products. Uh, that's where, you know, you really, on that mission orientation, you want to see the technology reach its full potential. So you really do um, both work internally and work with uh, partners to bring it to market. Uh, I'm still here. My camera just stopped. There you are. All right. You brought a pitch deck along with you, and I was hoping to bring that up. We have three slides to look at, and this is really interesting. Can you talk us through the first one, please? Yeah. So like I was mentioning, Mammoth was founded on this idea of delivering on what we see as the true promise of uh, CRISPR technology. And on the therapeutic side, it's really this idea of permanent cures for genetic disease. And that's really exciting and would be transformative for patients' lives. Um, and in particular, um, really thinking about, you know, this mission orientation broadly around what's possible with CRISPR. And that led us to actually invent this whole new field of CRISPR-based diagnostics, which is one of the uh, first new techniques for doing molecular detection that uh, has been invented in well, decades, frankly. And we've all lived through the pandemic, of course, and we've seen this kind of choice you have to make between do you want really accurate testing or do you want really accessible testing? Um, like antigen versus PCR. And I think the promise of CRISPR uh, on the diagnostic side is to really enable decentralized but high quality molecular testing, um, not just for infectious disease, but uh, even beyond. Um, and that's, it's a really ambitious vision. Um, and, you know, uh, it requires investors to take that long term view, right? There's, a, it's a complex business, like a lot of companies are only working on even a subset of one of these areas. And of right. course, when you're actually executing, you have to focus down. And that's where Rashid was very helpful in terms of thinking through, oh, okay, like, you know, this is the grand vision and how do you segment that and sequence things in the right order. Um, but I think in general, uh, it really is you're kind of like getting together for this multi-decade ride. And uh, that's uh, the most important thing to be upfront about this from an excitement perspective to like get people interested, but also from an alignment perspective in terms of like, you know, this is our bold vision of where we want to go. Yeah. And, and one thing that I, I think a lot of companies struggle with is, is communicating that long turn or that long burn. So Trevor, can you, can you give some advice on, on how to do that? Because some, a lot of these companies they're you're not going to hit profitability for some years. Yeah. I think if there's like two failure modes. One is that you focus too much on like, what's the next step you can do. And then, you're kind of left wondering like, well, how does this become like an important uh, generational company? Um, but like, it's very clear what's happening next or it's too far on the other end. And it's like, there's this broad ambitious vision of like, we're going to transform healthcare, but then it's like super unclear where you're starting and like, okay, like I really believe in the point B we're getting to from point A, but it, like help me draw the line. So I think you have to be able to very quickly develop this intuition for kind of moving in between the two around, you know, when is the right time to talk about the bold vision and how to introduce that? And then how to make sure people are along for the ride on, okay, and the, this is the next step that we take mm -hmm. that's very clear. And then there's a hundred steps in between maybe. Um, but yeah, just getting really clear about here's the bold vision. And then this is the path that we're going to take there. And it's a really long path and there's a lot of risk and it might go wrong and the path might have to be adjusted over time. But like, it's very clear the way, the thought process you have for how you're going to get in between those two points. Your seat, I, I can see you want to chime in here. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the core thing was right. That uh, the, the mission that tied everybody together was let's save as many lives as possible with CRISPR. Uh, right from from day one, because we felt that this was going to be a very fundamental technology. So before Mammoth, the business model that most companies took was, hey, here is a new bioengineering technology, but we are going to just keep it to ourselves. Almost think of it as like an IBM mainframe-like strategy. This is our technology. We're going to make the chips. We're going to make the computers. We're going to make the application. It all belongs to us. And Mammoth really was, you know, our view was that 10 years out with CRISPR, you know, with the presence of Mammoth, there should be many, many more products that exist. The odds that we can build everything with it is not going to be very feasible. It is like the Intel or the Microsoft of bioengineering. Now, when you do one of these platforms, you have to make your own applications. You have to show the world what you can do with it. But then you also have to sort of have a desire and, and a mindset to align and partner with the folks uh, on it. And, and that was, and, and that also sort of meant that you know, and, and that was, so, so you had to sort of go ahead and have this broad thing. So you have to sort of have the strategic thing, right? You have to think through the end of the chess game, but you also sort of have to have amazing tactical execution, right? It's like, you know, people who know me have heard me say that they can do 10 things, but just one at a time kind of thing. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and so, so those, those factors end up, so then you know, who's, you know, what is the journey? What is kind of the next step? 
And, and then, you know, how do you sort of then develop a culture of accountability? How do you sort of go ahead and identify what is your core competency? And yeah. Into, right. Like one of the things that, that we could always also sense with Trevor was a strong sort of eagerness and a desire to sort of work and do deals and focus on revenue, right? Sometimes in deep tech, people think about revenue and fundraising as overhead or things you shouldn't do versus you know, it could, we could see that Trevor actually enjoyed, appreciated that, right? And, and uh, uh, you know, much later now, right? I mean, the other thing has always been like, you know, a five-year time horizon on, on in terms of when you think of your runway and, and, and work through a range of those things. So these were, so as I said, right, these were all things that kind of come together. Um, um, and, and that, and these things are very hard to retrofit in a company. If you don't have it at founding, then you don't have investors that are aligned, that have signed up for that journey. Then you so can let, have me, some let me interject here. At the beginning, as an investor, and you've been on both sides, you found a company, sold companies, and now you're in, on the investor side. What do you like to see at the beginning? Or what did Trevor get right at the beginning? I'm trying to nail the actual thing here. So the, Tre Trevor got his mission and purpose of the company, right? He got the working relationship and dynamic, right? Not just with us as investors, but mm -hmm. creating an extended team of support around him. Uh, you know, as we did the seed round, we asked him, hey, you know, who would be a good entrepreneur mentor for you, right? Who's an ideal person on your wish list? He gave us a few names. We had some names. Uh, some of the names he had on his list, uh, you know, we didn't know, right? But he knew how to make people work for him, right? He knew how to get me to sort of then pick up the phone, call people, you know, set up meetings uh, and not just me, right? He had this whole team of other people that he was able to you know, recruit around that. Then when it came to sort of the conduct, there was a strong tendency to seek out excellence, benchmark excellence, and then pick excellence, right? So I'll give an example. Normally, as we were doing our seed and, you know, to a sort of diligence process, right? He ended up picking our investor council. Uh, you know, uh, to be his company counsel or the you know, our IP counsel to be his IP counsel because he was looking at what was going to be different or 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 or, or, or a better and kind of align on that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, his coach now is like Steve Jobs' coach, right? He's also the coach of the DoorDash founders, right? And so there's this tendency to sort of want to understand and benchmark excellence. There's often times when you have really smart young people, you kind of introduce them to a lot of really amazing people there's a tendency to learn and then just go do it yourself. Yes. Trevor had this natural instinct of going and recruiting people out to the cause and, and always kind of sort of being able to attract uh, the best people. And that then shows up in the way the company is able to execute because then he's able to get them. He's able to sort of go ahead and partner with them, make them comfortable. So, so these, these were examples of the kind of things that were there right at the beginning, the culture. Did you see in, in the Zoom window... How Trevor smiled when you said he he got people to work for him, <laughs> right? I, I did. I saw that he blushed a little and he had, he had a great smile. So Trevor, what what's the secret there? How do you get people to work for you? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's really the shared vision, right? Like if you're all working on something that you're all excited about, then I mean, of course you're gonna try your hardest to make sure it's realized into the world, right? Um, I don't think anything else is really a substitute for that, honestly. So I think it's really alignment around the potential of uh, the company's mission and vision, and then everything else flows from that. Just like that, that easy. Uh, I mean, that simple, maybe not that easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's take a look at the next it's slide. It's got to be lived every day, right? It's got to be lived every day. There is a, um, and, and we see this rubber hit the road as investors a lot, right? Uh, where somebody will say it's X, Y, and Z, and then faced with a difficult choice. There is uh, there is uh, sometimes a tendency to kind of retrench or or pick like an easy way out or or get territorial or like insecure, right? There is uh, there is there is a certain degree of fearlessness that we could also see, right? It was a very matter of fact uh, kind of dynamic where you know intense ambition and desire to succeed, but yes, a degree of calm composure and and you know not defensive. Right. That's very important because if you are defensive, then it's hard to get people to come and really work for you. I like that. So, so you can't be defensive. You have to take the feedback no matter what it is. Yeah. You have to engage on the feedback, right? You don't have to agree with it. As Trevor said, you have to be able to engage and have a conversation. Um, That's great. Well, let's, let's talk through this next slide here. Yeah. Trevor, so I think, 
one of the things early on in Mammoth is that we just viewed the potential of CRISPR differently and more broadly, I think, than others. Um, so uh, when we thought about what makes CRISPR special is, uh, you know, is it the scissors for the editing or something else? Really what we landed on is that it's this idea of kind of CRISPR as this search engine for biology and this kind of control F functionality where you can program the CRISPR protein by giving it this thing called a guide RNA, and you can then have it you know, bind to any DNA or RNA sequence you want. And you can use that um, in cells to do editing, and you can tell it that you want to you know, uh, knock out a gene and like turn it off or turn a gene on or change the spelling of a gene. It's almost like the genome is now this Word document, and you can spell check it. Um, or you can think about diagnostics as well, and it becomes more natural to think about the uh, you know CRISPR across these applications because now you're finding a sequence that you want to detect, and then you're sending out a molecular signal flare saying, "Hey, I detected it," um, and then you're reading that out. So I think we just had this foundationally different view from the rest of the space around the broad potential of CRISPR, both within therapeutics and you know doing classical ways that people have uh, done editing in that space and beyond. Um, and then also moving it into new areas that we invented entirely like diagnostics. So I think it was a very bold vision and a little bit counterintuitive even, especially for the time. Um, but yeah. I think uh, that was- Well, this uh, is 2017, right? Yeah, the company was founded in late 2017, I believe. So is this seed deck from right around then? Well, the elements of it, the graphics yeah. are clean. What I'm trying to get at is, is this, <laughs> this vision, this vision seemed to, uh, seemed to be, is very, is very complete. Right. So did you already receive feedback from others or, or is this all internal? Well, I think, yeah, this is something where you obviously have to start with a core vision around like really what the co-founding team truly believes is, you know, the direction the company should go. But then, yeah, you have to bring that into the world, I think, and <laughs> see how people interact with it. Maybe you've missed something or maybe like there's an additive thing that you've missed that's actually extremely exciting. Or maybe you missed something that you're like, oh, okay, actually, no, that is right. Like I need to adjust. Um, I think, you know, that in, there's always this con concept of like MVPs for products. Um, but I think it is also good in general to get your mission and vision out into the world as well and like, you know, understand where it kind of sits more broadly. I think if you just keep it bottled up, um, that's not a terribly useful way of engaging. So. Yeah. Uh, you, go ahead, Yoshi. I was going to say there's a, a question to ask from my perspective for Trevor here, right? Which is, uh, you know, what kept you going, right? It wasn't easy, right? You didn't have, uh, you know, a lot of people who would buy into this. The way you were building this company was, as you alluded to earlier, right? The scientist entrepreneur was not the way these companies were happening. Um, and, and there was definitely a certain degree of composure and the way you kind of, and, and persistence and tenacity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how much, you know, how did you keep, how do you keep yourself going through those kind of phases, right? Because it wasn't just at seed or at series A, right? you know, at series B and it was only, it got, it got easier only after series B kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think, I mean, there's two things. One is like believing in the potential of the technology and the vision and the mission and like really, you know, whether other people believe it or not, just like seeing that that's the future and, you know, linked to that is, you know, the team at the company, right. And like the co-founders that I was working with, like, if you're working with really smart people that you respect. I mean, it, it's hard to go wrong, honestly, right? And it's linked to the first one, right? Because the way you work with really smart people that you respect is that you share a vision and a mission that's really ambitious and, but achievable and like something that's really gonna change the world. And, you know, like throughout my uh, life so far, um, like I've never been like steered wrong by just working with people, like always trying to be the dumbest person in the room, basically, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that just makes it so easy to just plow through every day. Let's talk about the elephant in the room here. Uh, I mean, your co-founder is Nobel Prize winner and, and part of the venture of the yeah. technology, right? Uh, yeah. how, did you, how did you get Jennifer involved? Yeah, well, so Jennifer and Janice and Lucas are the inventors of the technology. And uh, I think they're, you know, despite the fact that I'm from Stanford and they're from Berkeley, uh, we, you know, put, put our differences aside. Um, but I think it was really around sharing this vision that was ambitious and like a lot of CRISPR companies, well, no CRISPR companies, you know, have really tried to go 
in this ambitious and abroad in this uh, kind of overarching vision of like what the potential of CRISPR really is. Um, and I think that was really exciting um, that, hey, like we can go big here and we can really make a generational company and we don't need to think small and like, you know, just dice things out. And that that's a, especially in biotech, kind of a bold idea. It's like unusual, unfortunately. Um, and, but I, I think it really resonates. Yeah, and that kind of leads me into my last last series of questions here. Your sheet, you told me last week that you only make about one investment a year, and I was hoping to hear why. Um, so I think uh, you know the I I I, I average one. I you know I try to do more, uh, but but generally uh, these tend to be deep partnerships. Um, you know, in 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 Trevor's case and Mammoth. First, I think I'll, I'll kind of take take the point. I think one of Trevor's strengths is he's usually the best listener in the room. Uh, you know, and 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 he's generally the smartest, uh, one of the smartest people in the room, but usually the best listener. Uh, and and I think that has sort of worked to his strength out there on that end. And so on Mammoth, right? I think uh, from C to A, I think we were probably talking three, four times a week, spending hours in a week together. Uh, you know, um, um, you know, he's been very modest about how you know Jennifer and Janice and Lucas decided to sort of kind of have him as their CEO. Uh, right, because they, you know, were graduating. They were inventors of the technology. They were getting chased to kind of go do a company. They could, they, you know, they were getting money for those kind of things. And sure. and and it was how sort of, you know, and so it was about engaging in the conversations, facilitating, right, helping think through what does it mean to do this one big anchor platform company together. What does it make to sort of join forces? How you kind of operate. Um, and so, so there were just the, the usually at the inception stage, a lot of work can kind of go in because it's impossible to retrofit that culture and foundation, especially. And then, if a company is a software company, it's often easier to pivot and fix. But if it's a hard tech company, the cost is is just way higher, Absolutely. and you don't even have the agility to sort of go do that. Um, and 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 our, my view is that you know a lot of the alpha creation in early stage venture happens when there's a very deep trust relationship that forms between the founders and, and sort of the, the lead investor who typically will be often the largest sort of shareholder outside of the founders in the company. Um, and, and, and so you can almost look at my job as that being a coach and, you know, the founders are, are kind of uh, amazing athletes. And, and, uh, and so hopefully they are elite athletes and we are the elite coaches and we can together win the championship. But that then requires us to sort of understand, right, the game, what the needs are, adapt our style to sort of the founder needs, right? Can't be cheerleaders all the time. But if the trust doesn't exist, then how do we sort of go ahead and provide feedback or influence? And and that kind of relationship development uh, just doesn't happen overnight, right? It takes, uh, takes a certain amount of time. Now, uh, clearly, we do a lot of investments in tech and software and crypto and, and a range of things. And then there's a lot of investment in, in sort of human and planet health companies. And the cool thing about human and planet health companies is, you know, everybody wants every company to succeed. Like, you know, it just, it's, a, it's just a very collaborative dynamic. It's like f- way fewer sharp elbows in that domain because, you know, you, you really want, you want these things to kind of work. Um, and so, yeah, so this is why we, I, I often end up spending as much time with founders that we don't end up investing in, but hopefully we ended up helping their company become better. And mm-hmm. I end up getting way more referrals from a lot of those founders when their friends are starting companies as well. Yeah. And, and I mean, you two are very agreeable people, uh, clearly. How do you handle disagreements? Trevor? Yeah. And no, I mean... Yeah, I mean, hopefully you have disagreements. Otherwise, you're not talking about the right things. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually a red flag if you don't yeah, disagree yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's you just have to. I mean, you have to have respect, like mutual respect. To your sheet's point, exactly right. Otherwise, there's not going to be any constructive work. Um, and then, I'm a big believer in like having the big debate, and I'm also a big believer in the whole disagree and commit, right? And right or wrong, like you're all on the ship together, <laughs> and once that decision's made whoever side is, you know, the one that ends up being decided on, there's no second guessing, right? And like, maybe you'll pivot later, right? Maybe it was the wrong choice, but I think it goes back to the respect, right? And like, okay, look, we learned it was wrong. We're going that way, or maybe it was right, but there's no, like, I told you so's or anything like that. I think that's a breakdown of respect. And I think as long as that's the case, disagreement is actually one of the most productive things you can possibly do in a relationship. Yeah. That's how you grow, right? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, your sheet to you. 
Yeah. So I think, um, you know, in a VC position, right, um, it's so easy to get for VCs to get canceled these days that it's really hard for VCs to actually voluntarily sort of disagree or give feedback or say something negative for the fear of offending someone, right? Um, and so I I sort of have a commitment where if I, you know, if somebody's taking time out of building their company to kind of engage with me in a conversation, right, that I'm going to be always fully honest. Um, and and uh, now the, the key, the question though, is that it becomes a very different level of conversation when people actually seek feedback or seek disagreement or seek sort of, mm. you know, input, right? And it's one thing to ask for it. It's another thing to sort of see if people truly kind of care about it. Um, and and I do think that that is the one thing that, you know, relative to other entrepreneurs, right, that I see Trevor actually do sort of very well. Sometimes, you know, I don't like the word that uh, gets used in in some entrepreneurial circles circle about like founders have to be coachable, right? It's a, it's it's a different kind of dynamic. There's like while there is an entrepreneur coach kind of dynamic, it's you know they, it's it, it, you know it, it's not about some people you know being agreeable with you kind of all the time, but it's being about being able to engage, right? Sort of seek, explain. Um, and, 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 and then sometimes not have an explanation, but say, Hey, trust me, I need to kind of go in this other direction and kind of yeah. go and do that. And then, yes, when we are there, then it's a, the culture is an ongoing thing, right? Then we are committed. There is no, I told you so as ever. And, and there is all about like, you know, yes, we are in it and how we're going to go continue working and building. Um, and there's no need to even kind of go and talk about, okay, this was right or that was wrong. It doesn't matter. That's just the past. It's like, how are we going to go ahead? Sure. And, and focus on sort of doing a range of the things right. And this um, has been great. And, and and I have a question from the audience, if you don't mind. I'm going to read this. But the question I'll give you to at the beginning so you can hear it is, how do you find your business partner when you're starting the industry? But Daniel writes, I'm currently a student at Penn State studying finance and biology. While I have a dream of one day dedicating my life to an idea of movements, like you said in the live stream, I'm having a f- hard time, one, finding a CRISPR oriented idea worth dedicating my life to and two, finding like-minded individuals to discuss my interests with. So my question is, how did you find your business partner when you were starting in the industry and when you were sure you want to dedicate your life to something? Yeah. I mean, I can start, I think it just starts with being interested in the vision and the mission, like broadly, right? Like synthetic biology or, you know, or whatever it is, like computational biology or, you know, space or rockets or you know, anything, right? And like, if that's something you truly are really excited about, you're going to start to naturally like read the certain, you know, blogs or like, you know, the Twitter community, whatever it is right now, right? Mm-hmm. The um, Snapchat community. <laughs> sure my age at this point. You're, sounding, um, you're sounding much older yeah. than you are. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. But I think in general, like once you start doing that, you're naturally going to find the people and like the places and it's a long journey, right? Because you don't want to just be like, oh, like what's what's hot right now? And like, oh, okay, that's the thing like, I want to look at. I mean, you can, and that's a fine place to start, but it's going to take a long time to like understand the space and the people. And, and I think if it's something you really are passionate about, you're going to find all your spare time you're reading about it and like you're meeting people and you're like talking about it. And I think it'll happen more naturally than you expect. Um, and I think that's where there is some controversy about um, like remote versus in person. I think there is a benefit actually to being in these hubs, like for certain things where there is more, like you kind of create your own luck a little bit. And like, I think you do have more spontaneous interaction. So I'm a, I'm a little bit of a fan of, you know, for example, the Bay, the Bay Area, or like, you know, Boston or other places yeah. where you're just going to be constantly, like you're a particle that's just constantly colliding with other interesting people. And there's probably ways to do that remote too. But I think um, that that's like an important element of it. And it's hard to like place your finger on it and it's hard to like draw the exact path. But I think once you start getting really passionate about a topic and diving into it, you just naturally start to, to meet people and uh, interact. So, yeah. yeah. Yoshi, do you have any feedback on that? Yeah, uh, I think... Um... It, it does start with uh, sort of kind of, um, you know, identifying what you are going to be really good at, um, right? And then often sometimes if you're kind of wondering where your natural strengths are, right? Like by the time you ask, you know, your, your parents or your professors, teachers, uh, friends, right? You, you probably kind of start seeing what are some of the things that you may naturally gravitate. And it may be related to your education, it may not be, but then how do you kind of get really good at it? And and that then naturally helps you align with other people who are kind of going to be really good at it as well. 
Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we think that uh, companies are fundamentally limited by the learning ability and agility of the founders. And, and it is, it is, so the, you just have to be extraordinarily learners, but learners, not just in areas that you know well, right? In other areas, you have to be able to benchmark excellence, form relationships, teams, right? So, so the, the other part is just this, this interpersonal dynamics, and, and how you kind of build relationships ends up sort of end up being the other parts. You have to, like, our view is if you are really good at something, it's really lonely to do a solo founder company. So ideally you want to have a team that is there with you. Um, and so you want to be really good at it. That's where people can respect you for that, right? And, and you know, more relationships break down, uh, you know, because there isn't enough, you know, trust is clearly a basic one, but actually, frankly, respect, right? You need, like, in, in at work or in, in personal life, you have to be able to kind of have a lot of mutual respect. Um, and and then then the right sort of working dynamic and this is where I'll I'll second uh, Trevor's point that uh, the geography part is uh, you know you you you're kind of committing with a you know on a common mission a lot of incomplete information these things are really hard to do on Zoom across a distance sure uh, so yeah. well Penn State's a, a huge school so surely there there's somebody there in State College Pennsylvania yeah. to to help right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Um, and, and we have to move on to the next section. The, the, the next section is called pitch practice. We'll talk about this. Pitch practice is one, one of those parts of where we like to emphasize that entrepreneurs need to practice their pitch to anyone that will listen. And right now we have two amazing people to listen and we have several companies lined up to pitch their company. So what's going to happen is the, an entrepreneur is going to come on. They have two minutes to present their company. And then they get four minutes of feedback on the pitch itself. So with that said, we're going to bring the first one on. You guys ready for this? Trevor was very excited to do this. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, yeah. He didn't think he got, got a chance to do that. He thought he had to drop, but he does not. So. Yeah, they surprised me as well right at the start. So I'm excited. Yeah. Okay. And and the first company we have is Nestlings Inc. And presenting for Nestlings is Soma Sotesh. Did I say that right? Are you there? No, I guess we have the wrong one up first. How about we go to Glossbird? Glossbird is Alina Matson. Fantastic, Alina. yes. There you are, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, let me know when I can start. Right now, go. Fantastic, well, hey everyone, my name is Alina and I am the founder of Glossbird and the mission of our startup is to create wellness for gamers through games. So my background, I used to work over 60 hours a week and I did not have time for exercise. Well, uh, I had some time to play video games and scroll through Instagram. So it wasn't so much a lack of time, but really a lack of motivation. And after customer discovery calls, I learned I wasn't the only one, which is why we're building Fitment. Fitment is a social mobile game designed for bite-sized workouts. You can think of it like Duolingo meets Animal Crossing for exercise. Unlike other fitness apps on their market, we're not trying to turn low fitness folks into hardcore regulars, but instead trying to motivate the 77% of Americans who don't get enough exercise, motivate them to exercise for a few minutes a day. Fitment features one to six minute long workouts. You can do anytime and anywhere, including your desk, your couch. Also features uh, social features like a team mode. So you can team up with your friends and keep up a team streak. And also we're the only fitness game featuring a wholesome game world that our players want to keep coming back to. My background is in product development engineering, where I've worked now with over two dozen startups and companies like Meta to release game changing products. My co-founder, Samara, she, her background is in the indie game space and also has a background in psychology and healthcare. Uh, right now, we've been bootstrapping and have just released Fitment on both iOS and Android for early access and recently gotten back from Spain from the free-to-play campus mobile gaming accelerator. Our ask of the audience today is we're raising a $1 million pre-seed and would love to get any warm intros and advice and, on this pitch. Thank you. That was great. Your seeds, let's start with you. Uh, well, let's let's have Trevor go first. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, sure. yeah first of all, great job. And obviously, like it's a high stakes forum. So <laughs> you did a very like very measured and yeah, really great presentation. Um, I think a couple of things stood out to me, just kind of train of thought. I think first mm -hmm. of all, I really liked how you started with like clear mission, 
like personal problem. Like there's no question in my mind, like what you're doing. Sometimes that's the thing. Um, so I thought that was what I saw as the strongest part of it. Um, I think also, yeah, you really hit a lot of the key points that kind of I was, I was hoping you would around like, who's the team? Like, why are they qualified and uniquely enabled to do this? And, you know, what's the problem and what's the solution? I think the one area that um, would have been interesting to learn more about is one of the trickiest ones, I think, for any startup, um, which is like the why now. Um, mm -hmm. My impression of the space is like, this is a problem for like millennia, right? Like exercise, like I faced this in my life. I'm, I hopefully I can use the product too. Um, but um, like what's changed in the world or like the, like, why is this company the right company for now and not five years ago or not five years from now? That would, that would be my only question. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll second many other things that Trevor said, right? Which is you were clear about the mission. You were really good in describing what the product is. Who is it for? Uh, you know, uh, so I think all of those things, uh, you know, it, and it's not often easy to see it come out with that level of clarity within a minute. So that that is great. Uh, I think uh, uh, my, my feedback is a little bit of a different sort of side of the coin of the point that Trevor kind of made, which is uh, just as he said, why now? It, it kind of comes down to this is a problem that the world has kind of generally known about it for a while. So you start talking about a unique take on why you're doing it through sort of the game, but mm -hmm. it's unclear about like, what is the core insight that actually will help you solve this problem, right? Because like this notion of eat well exercise has been around there. And so how you are, you know, you identify, start identifying how there's a lack of motivation. And so the core then question is how do you sort of go ahead and motivate, engage, sustain? And, and then in this particular category of company, very domain specific feedback often is what becomes kind of the business model where mm -hmm. you have the issue of becoming like, the, you know, everyone remembers how everybody was walking around with Pokemon Go for a few months and then it kind of dismissed. So the point is how do you sort of then make it sustainable? Um, so those would be sort of two things that I think a lot of people would have as top, people who have generally followed the domain will have as kind of top of mind items that, that you can kind of go ahead and address. Uh, mainly because the question is, you know, big goal of this pitch is really to get people to give you the time. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and do a deeper dive out around on that end. And, and just the ability to, in a couple of minutes, touch upon, you know, we, we, we have, we've solved some of the hard problems. Here's like some proof points around it. Mm -hmm. uh, or the fact that we can even allude to it where most people won't. Will, will sort of get you just better meetings and conversations. That's awesome. Thank you. And yeah. I love you that you mentioned Pokemon Go too, which I think is one of the greatest uh, fitness apps of all time because yeah. it, it motivated a lot of folks. Correct. And so it's like, how do you sustain that part of it kind of how it ends up becoming? Yeah. Do you guys remember that, that weekend Pokemon Go was released? I, I swear world peace. That was the closest yeah. we ever got to that. <laughs> Everyone was out walking around just trying to find Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> Entire world. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. Best of luck to you. And please reapply. I'd love to hear how this, this evolves. Nice. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And unfortunately, my producer tells me the other two people are no show, and that's that's the uh live aspect of doing live programming. So uh <laughs> I'm an, I'm going to pitch and instruct people on how to do this. If you just search for TechCrunch pitch practice, you'll come up with a form. And I'll put that on the top of TechCrunch as soon as I'm off this stream as well. So please apply and, and come on and, and pitch all these entrepreneurs and investors. The, the point of this is you need to practice pitching and this is a great venue to do it. So please come and participate. It's free, so why not? <laughs> so everyone, thank you so much for joining us. And, and I have to plug one more thing before we go. TechCrunch Disrupt is live and in person again, finally, after all these years. October 18th through the 20th in San Francisco and downtown at Moscone Center. So please come and attend. I'll be there. I'm hosting Startup Battlefield, and there's a huge lineup of speakers. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.